Welcome to CFTC Talks. I'm your host, Andy Bush. Remember, there's an important disclaimer at the end of the show you should listen to. This week, we return to policymaking in our nation's capital to gain a perspective on the agricultural sector and food. This will be part two of a two-part series on this subject, as we will have the chairman of both the Senate and the House Agricultural Committees come on the show. Joining us today is Texas Republican Congressman from the 11th District, Mike Conaway. Congressman Conaway is the chairman of the House Agricultural Committee, and he serves on the House Armed Services Committee and the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Mr. Chairman, welcome to CFTC Talks. Well, Andy, thanks for having me on. One slight correction, I'm the chairman of the powerful House Agriculture Committee, so just make sure we get that squared away. But uh, no, thanks, thanks, Andy. I appreciate being on, buddy. Thank you very much. Not a problem. Well, I'll make sure I include that going forward at every communication I have. (laughs) Well, before we get to the ag questions, I'd like to talk to you about your career. Now, you served in the U.S. Army at Fort Hood. You got your CPA, then you were appointed to the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy, served as a board member and chair. But for fans of Friday Night Lights, I have to ask you about the Permian football team and the 1965 state championship team you played on. You know, I've read the book, I've seen the movie, I've watched the series, and I have to ask you, are the folks in Odessa, Texas as crazy about football today as they were when you played and you had that first state football championship? Well, the the community is a little bigger now than it was then, so there were the 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 you know the, the intensity was a little bit uh, <clears throat> more so at that point in time. But <clears throat> throughout that thirty year reign that Permian uh, had that uh, terrific uh, run during high school football from the sixty five through the mid nineties, uh, yes, they were pretty avid fans, and there were uh, some Hollywood associated with the movie and and uh, and the book, but. Uh, uh, good people supporting the kids, and and uh, it was really a great experience. And quite frankly, pretty surprising. I still be talking about it, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, you know, a hundred years since uh, we got that done. We thought it was a big deal at the time, but none of us had any idea that that uh, Permi would would be able to continue that strength, that series of of uh, excellence. Uh, the book was actually the '88 season, and uh, uh, and then the uh, '89 season, Permian went undefeated and won the mythical USA Today National Championship and then and, and won a couple of cha- uh, state championships in the 90s. So a long run and uh, uh, great to be associated with a program of that quality. Well, I, I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Gene Mayfield was the coach. And I, I, I think you took away a lot of really important experiences from that that, that still help you to this day. Well, they do. There are three men who had a uh, meaningful impact in my life. Obviously, my dad, <clears throat> and then Coach Mayfield, and then a gentleman I worked for at Price Waterhouse during my career there. But uh, yeah, Coach Mayfield came in in uh, uh, the spring of '64 and inherited a uh, a little bit of talent, not a lot, but a little bit. We had one blue chipper that went on to play uh, at uh, University of Texas and, and starred there as a middle linebacker. Uh, a guy named Glenn Hosso, but for the most part, uh, just your normal group of kids. And, and he brought in coaches, and that following uh, fall, uh, you know, it, it turned us into a, a 13-1 state championship team. And uh, it was a pretty remarkable turnaround to have started uh, from where he did. You know, that's the other story is how quickly Mayfield was able to turn around. We were 4-6, and six, I believe, my junior year, and worked really good. And then uh, the following year, he took the, uh, a group of guys that uh, – uh, was able to force us to overachieve and and uh, you know through his program uh, helped us win a state championship and uh, just a great gentleman. <clears throat> Life lessons learned as a part of that experience that year I spent with him. Uh, you know, being prepared, uh, always being in better shape than the other team, uh, no excuses. You know, showing up. You know, all those kind of things that that helped us win that year. Uh, I've used many of those life lessons uh, throughout my career to, to help me get to where I am today. Oh, that's great. Well, Congressman, obviously you're still using them because you chair the House Agricultural Committee. and See, every- Andy, it's the powerful House Agricultural Committee. <laughs> I, gotta, I just got to keep hammering this studio, buddy. got to keep hammering it, too. But yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. No, that's right. I got to. I got to make a mental note here. I'm writing it down. Um, getting back to the right, you're committee. writing down a mental note. What is going on here? Well, go that's ahead. that's that's who I am. Uh, but every five years, seriously, every five years, you guys work on something that's super critical for the farm sector, and that's the farm bill. Um, and to that end, the members of the committee, you guys, recently held hearings down in I think it was San Angelino, Texas, at the end of uh, July, and and you did that to hear from farmers and ranchers about the bill. What did you learn from those hearings and what did you take away? 
Well, Andy, we had five actually listening sessions around the country. We'll have a fifth one this coming Monday up in upstate New York. But we had one in San Angelo. We had one in Minnesota. We had one in Illinois, one in California, and uh, in Florida. And so um, each of them had a little different flavor, as you'd expect, based on the crops that were grown in that particular area. But throughout all of them, there was a uh, you know one gentleman kind of summed it up the best. And he said six words, uh, safety net, uh, uh, oh gosh, oh, crop insurance, safety net, and don't screw it up. So, or no changes. <laughs> and then another gentleman said, with respect to crop insurance, don't screw it up. Right. So pretty much every session, we, you know, began or it was with, uh, with crop insurance. A lot of information or, or support for the various trade programs that we have. Uh, and the uh, and obviously Title One, so but each one of them was a little different. We heard from 302 already uh, good citizens on these listening sessions as opposed to hearings. Mm-hmm. Uh, much better format. Each one of them, the members that were there, we had the, I think the smallest group of members was went maybe up to 11. Sat for two, two and a half, three hours listening to constituents tell us what's working with the farm bill, what's not working with the farm bill. Uh, you know, uh, unheard of it itself to have that many members of Congress be that quiet for that length of time uh, <laughs> and listen to listen to the folks. Mm. They're going to have to live with whatever we wind up doing. Now, obviously, each one of them had uh, you know some leadership of of, uh, of uh, associations with us, but mm-hmm. by and large, the folks were just citizens who showed up, uh, wanted to share their story, share their heart with us, and uh, looking forward to New York this coming Monday to uh, to hear the same thing from uh, from that folks as well. But uh, crop insurance has got great support. Uh, Title One, uh, trade, <clears throat> and the and rural development, all the things you'd expect to hear. Uh, now, what I didn't hear was uh, anybody saying they wanted to spend less money. And so we'll have the, the daunting challenge of, uh, of trying to meet a variety of needs with, with limited resources. But that's the, that's the beast of, of what we do. Well, in, in your estimation, well, what's the agriculture community struggling with today? Low commodity prices across mm-hmm. the board. You've got the natural disasters that we're coping with in Texas and Florida, Georgia, uh, <clears throat> the normal, those kinds of things. A little unprecedented, the kind of scope that we've had this year all at once with three storms. But uh, but low commodity prices the last four years, a 50% drop in production income over that time frame, the worst that we've had since the Depression. And so it's all about commodity prices. Input costs have not gone down proportionally, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, they rarely ever do. And so uh, uh, the folks are reliant on uh, both crop insurance for the disasters as well as our two uh, signature programs under the Title I uh, to uh, try to survive to the next crop year. I mean, the thing that's uh, most amazing about production agriculture, the farmers and ranchers across this country in the face of the most daunting challenges, the most daunting odds you could imagine, are willing to tee it up again if they just could get to the resources that would allow them to do that for next year's crop. <clears throat> it's an amazing group of men and women who uh, who feed this country and feed the world, quite frankly, and uh, and they do it, uh, you know, hard work, sweat equity, risk-taking, and reliance on a safety net provided by solid uh, you know, agriculture policy in our country. Well, walk us through some of the key areas where the Farm Bill will help reduce the risk of food production in the United States. Well, the uh, obviously we've got crop insurance is the signature piece, and uh, we've got to strengthen that. There are constant calls for folks to do away with crop insurance and others, and, and uh, in the face of what we've been experiencing, what production agriculture is, but I don't want to include myself, but what production agriculture has been experiencing, mm-hmm. uh, clear need for that. Title One is an income support program that, that uh, tries to alleviate some of the risks associated with pricing. You know, our farmers and ranchers across this country are price takers. Uh, they don't set the price on anything. They just have to take whatever the world price is and when you have nations around the world who do things to manipulate the price and or uh, screw up the markets uh, then we're you know with these policies trying to step in and try to protect our producers from things that are, are beyond their control beyond just the normal kind of risk that any business takes when uh, when going into business and so whether it's China with their policies or any policies or whoever it might be who distort our markets then uh, that's, uh, that's that's where these uh, other programs come in as well as we've got some other disaster things with respect to livestock and others that that uh, when you've got uh, cattle killed or trees uprooted whatever it might be we try to help uh, those producers uh, get back in business <clears throat> so that uh, so that the American producer let me let me set the table here Andy real quick sure the American consumer you know, the question is why do you need a farm bill why is it a big deal to have a, a, a farm bill or good agriculture policy in this country well the basis of that is the American consumer 
we as consumers, the folks who eat every day or would like to eat every day, enjoy the safest, most abundant, and cheapest or most affordable food and fiber supplies of any, devi- of any developed nation in the world. That is not by accident. That is by design. That is hardworking men and women in production agriculture doing all the things they do. And they're, yes, they're reliant on a, on, a ag- on a farm bill. So you can love the farm bill or you can hate the farm bill, but it in combination with the hard work, sweat equity, risk taking of the American producer allows the American consumer to get a deal. A deal every time they go to the grocery store, every time they go to the to a restaurant, now they get a deal. And we all love getting deals. I mean, it's hardwired in us to, to want a deal. <laughs> right. And we get that deal, but we don't know it, and we don't know why. Mm-hmm. Well, part of what we're trying to do is help, help that large group out there who should be supportive of ag policy, farm policy, to understand that and pitch in on our behalf to try to get this thing done. And that's the folks who enjoy those most affordable prices of any developed country in the world. Think about the families who live paycheck to paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, about half the country lives paycheck to paycheck. They spend, uh, you know, the, the bottom group, they spend about 35% of their uh, income, disposable income on food. That's a meaningful number. If we can hold that, if we can not do things that screw that up, then good for us. But if we do, we make arbitrary, capricious decisions that cause the cost of food to go up, shame on us. You know, as we go through these policies, that's going to be the metrics. I'm going to try to squeeze everything we do through, and that is, what does it do to the cost of food? Because that single mom or that, that, that paycheck to paycheck family, her food budget is where she flexes. Her rent doesn't change, car pump doesn't change. If something happens during the month, then it generally comes to her food budget, and then she's got to cope with that. Well, right now, that struggle is with the lowest prices in the developed world. I want to keep that. I want to keep that advantage for that single family, for that that paycheck to paycheck family out there that is uh, struggling to make ends meet. I do not want to make their lives any harder or tougher by doing something that causes the cost of food to go up when it's that way we don't have to. And so, love the farm bill, I hate the farm bill, but it's delivering along with the hard work and of, uh, of men and women in production and agriculture. Yeah, and you, a long rant there, but yeah. I, I appreciate you. Let me get that off my chest. <laughs> There's other components too to the bill. The the the, um, the question of helping young farmers as well come into the agriculture sector. I know it's very difficult for farmers right now. At, you mentioned prices dropping by about fifty percent since 2013, and farm incomes going down. I know that's a struggle for these guys, and I know they're having a hard time uh, drawing uh, talent to the sector. And and if you don't do anything about it, it doesn't seem like like a big deal until all of a sudden it is and then you have issues because you haven't had those bright minds that you want to come in and look at these issues and help out solving them. Well, it, well we've also got to pl- replace the folks who are aging out. And, sure. And that's important. You know, the, the great thing about young producers are that they are early adapters. Uh, whether it's new technologies, just new ideas, whatever it is, they are, they're the ones who are going to take the risks of doing some of those things that uh, may turn out to be the next quote-unquote big deal. Mm-hmm. But getting, you know, they all face uh, capital-intensive uh, early require, early early entries because if the land is really expensive and the equipment's really expensive, uh, they don't have any of the, uh, the uh, depth of resources that a, 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 you know, one of the more experienced producers has. They don't have that accumulat- accumulation of good crop years to to set aside the, the backdrop that allows uh, the, uh, the asset base it allows a lender, the bar, the the banks, and whoever to lend to those because they know, in addition to the equipment in the farm, they've got something else. Well, young producers typically don't have that, and so we're always looking for better programs to incentivize young producers to get in to, to make that a little bit easier. Uh, and so, I, just like in the other farm bills, we will have hopefully new programs here where we're looking for better and newer ideas of how to how to bet, bootstrap young producers into a position where they can can uh, you know can it could get into farming get into production agriculture and stay uh you know even through the lean and hard times are going on right now but but uh, yeah they're vitally vitally important not only just to replace the folks who age out and and quit farming but also uh, in, in terms of, uh, like I said earlier, early adapters of new technology, new ideas, uh, you know, they're they're what more, uh, my, uh, you know, malleable in that regard than uh, some of us are kind of stuck in our way, so to speak. So, right. uh, important on lots of levels, and and as in farmer in previous farm bills, this farm bill will include, uh, you know, some new things. We hope to try to provide those kind of incentives and and ways to to bootstrap young producers into into the business. Well, I, you brought up early adopters of technology, and I I, I know the ag sector, uh, because of the low prices, everyone in the ag sector has been aggressively utilizing technology to remain competitive. What, what do you see are the top areas in ag tech? Because to me, it's 
it just blows me away the inventiveness and how how this is moving forward so fast with whether it's drones or driverless tractors or electric tractors or you know uh, it, technology to monitor crops. It's just it seems like the U.S. is leading on so many fronts here. Well, you know the. Typically, when folks think of farming, they think of just plowing and planting and harvesting <laughs> and the thing being very rudimentary. But what it belies that is the incredible breadth of, of technology across the entire span. You start with the seed. Uh, all of the technology that goes into trying to create a seed that will produce more, more reliable, uh, have the exact same kind of traits that you want, those kind of things from there, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the other end, whether it's precision uh, agriculture through GPS monitor, you know, GPS activities where they can plow exactly where they want to. Here's a here's a deal: they strip, um, you strip uh, uh, irrigation. All right, they bury these strips in the ground. Right. Uh, they come through in the early in the spring, or, you know, just one point of the year, and they uh, they plow across that strip exactly where they want to. They fertilize, uh, pre emerge all the stuff they do in exactly the same spot. They come back in the spring, and they want to plant those seeds in exactly the point they want to. Well, that was never able to do that uh, manually. You just kind of hit or miss. But today, we've got the industry has pre uh, precision industry where, where they can lay down the, the fertilizer chemicals exactly where they want to. They can come through and lay the seed in exactly at the, the spot they want it and in the densities that they want. Uh, they can monitor the watering. All those kind of things are happening through technology, and, and, and most folks don't think about that uh, in, in, in when they begin to think about uh, about agriculture. But but it is a uh, it's a technology intense industry. Um, yep, I'm sure, sure there's some primitive farmers out there who still have a, <laughs> a mule and a plow that they try to work and those kind of things, but they're barely feeding themselves. Uh, today's uh, today's agriculture is highly there's intensive uh, you know, technology involved, uh, lots and lots of science involved, and, and even the folks uh, that are you know, doing it have to, have to have a great background in it to be able to, uh, to utilize all those tools to their advantage, because at the end of the day, uh, <clears throat> we'll have another 3 billion people on this earth over the next 35 years, and we could not feed them all today. As show, science and technology will lead the way toward <clears throat> being able to continue to feed uh, the billions of folks in this world. And America, with her uh, blessing of abundant resources, abundant uh, croplands, and others, will have to lead that uh, you know lead that charge to be able to continue to feed. Uh, all the folks in the world. It, it is astonishing the the yields and the production, whether it's whether it's agriculture, whether it's cattle or sheep, or you go down the list. It's astonishing how those have been so abundant and and rapidly moving forward with advances in as I mentioned in yields and other things. I I think that's what's so exciting. But I mean, you think on the technology side, it it seems like in a very short period of time, farmers are going to be able to run almost their entire farm from a laptop. And I think I think that just kind of blows people away when you. When you describe how these are all interrelated, and then of course using the financial markets to be able to hedge what they do, so uh, it's certainly exciting times. Let me switch gears just a little bit because obviously your district's down in Texas. I know that you weren't; your district was not necessarily hit by uh, Hurricane Harvey, but you toured uh, the areas that were impacted. W what did you see, and and you know, w what did you learn when you did that? Well, there's a. You can see the pictures, you can hear the descriptions, but there is no substitute for standing in waist-high cotton has, that has been totally submerged in floodwaters. Wow. And then as that, and these, this was crop that was about to be harvested, to have that floodwater then recede mm -hmm. and leave the silt and the stuff that's there, and it looked like it had been harvested. It was just brown brown plants Jeez. that had been killed, and the, custom bowl, the, the cotton balls had been, bowls had been destroyed as well. Uh, and then to go to a module that <clears throat> was in <clears throat> one spot, have the Colorado River where the banks were four miles away from this module, to have the Colorado out of her banks to, with enough power to push that module uh, away from where it was and then have uh, you know, a watermark about waist high where it has sat in water and, uh, and it, it ruined that, bail, that, uh, that module and the smell of rotting cotton. Uh, there is no substitute for walking around in that. And then to be standing beside a, a young farmer who's uh, 800 acres, part of it was harvested. That was those modules we talked about, they were destroyed. He had yet to be harvested the stuff that had been flooded and drowned. Uh, the water was over the tops of the plants. And to hear his him talk about, you know, my family's fine, our place is fine, uh, my kids are fine, and my wife and I are going to fight this again next year. We've got crop insurance, we've got the things that we, that we can count on, our bankers are there. And as bad as, as bad as this is, then you know we're looking to the future. We're looking backwards. 
<clears throat> to put that in perspective, the crop that we were standing in was going to be a record crop. Things uh, that had been harvested wow. already, they knew the yields were monster, mm-hmm. and uh, but crop insurance can't 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 ensure that the 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 big yield. It can only ensure the average yield. And so, not only was uh, and, and Harvey came up quick. Remember, it, it was a relatively fast developing storm. Sure. And so, week out, they're standing there in those fields, looking at the monster cotton crop, uh, ready to harvest or getting starting to harvest it and those kind of things. And then to have it totally destroyed and all those hopes and aspirations and quite frankly, money in the bank destroyed. And then to have the resiliency and the strength of purpose and the strength of faith that. Uh, uh, they were going to do it again next year uh, with the help of the, the safety net, uh, you know, a banker, and uh, and just the will to keep going and stay in this business was awe-inspiring, quite frankly. Yeah, it says a lot about the community and, and that sector for sure. And one of the things, obviously, in, that was impacted pretty severely were the ports down mm-hmm. there. And the ports are really important for getting agricultural products out. And just kind of jogged in my mind, like, how does the agricultural community look at the, the current trade negotiations that are ongoing and and how important is this to their business well they're a little anxious about it uh, obviously the uh, uh nafta is a big deal uh, for production agriculture in america they've uh, generally in good shape and so the renegotiation of nafta has them a little concern that that things would probably be a problem there we export um over half of what we uh, produce uh, some crops more and some crops less but but on balance over half and so uh, we grow too much to be eating ourselves. We grow too much to produce and use ourselves. We've got to be able to sell it to other folks around the world. And quite frankly, other folks around the world want our production. Yeah. And so trade deals are vital to making that happen. With TPP, the, the production agriculture folks had stayed at at, uh, at uh, uh, trade rep Fromer's elbow and uh, Darcy Vitter's elbow the entire time. And except for rice and tobacco, most all the rest of production agriculture was relatively pleased with TPP. Uh, the, you know, obviously, the administration has decided to walk away from that, but that sets the framework or the ground ground kind of the base for what the trade deals will look like on a unilateral ba- on a bilateral basis with these countries as that starts forward. But but everyone in production agriculture understands exactly how important trade is, and uh, they are anxious that uh, that that they don't lose ground. That uh, agriculture interests aren't traded for other interests in other spectrums. There are other parts of the trade world. And so they're going to need to be at uh, Lighthouser's elbow, just the way they were from his elbow, uh, throughout these uh, bi- these bilateral deals, as well as the NAFTA renegotiation as well. Uh, I've taken a group up to Ontario, Canada over the weekend to talk to uh, our counterparts up there, explain to them just how important getting NAFTA done quickly is, and that uh, we need to make that those negotiations uh, go as quickly as we can, because the uncertainty of change associated with the change has already been unsettling to certain markets, and uh, we need to get that deal done quickly. Okay, chairman of the powerful House Agriculture Committee and congressman from the 11th District in Texas, Mike Conaway, thank you for coming on the show today. This is great. Uh, Andy, thank you for having me on, and I'll be happy to come back anytime, buddy. Fantastic. Thanks again. That's all for me this week. I hope you've enjoyed our two-part series on ag policy with the two chairmen from the House and the Senate Ag Committees. We'll be back next week with another guest on our quest to learn about the markets we watch. I'm Andy Bush. Thanks for listening. But wait, there's more. Disclaimer time. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service and is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or third party for any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages or lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in the podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provided similar services to those of the guests. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to the accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated and referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. The CFTC is providing this interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting future outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application of a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult with an attorney.